Welcome to another language change A level video with me, Paul, from the QE here in Darlington. This one is about graphological change. Now, when we talk about graphology, we're talking about the appearance of the language, either on screen or on paper. So we're looking at lettering, the symbols that are used to represent sounds. We're looking at orthography, which means the spelling. And we're also looking at punctuation as well. So there you've got a good example of old English graphological features, which of course are very different to current day English. This is taken from the old English epic poem, Beowulf. Okay, so if you go back to old English, then you can see that actually the lettering is similar, but slightly different to current day English. Um, there are some symbols, some letters, which are different to current day English. Uh, look at the last three letters that we've got here. So we've got a vowel sound, a, ah, that's the short vowel as in the cat sat on the mat. That's an A and an E combined together. That may be familiar to you because of course you've been studying the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, and that's what they use for the same sound. So this is called the ash symbol. So that's a feature in Old English. We also have these two over here which represent what we use as a digraph for, the TH digraph. So the one on the end there is a voiceless fricative sound. That's the th, as in the first symbol of theatre. And then we've got this one here. So theatre one, that one, the unvoiced, it looks like a P, but it isn't. It's a TH sound. And then we've got its cousin, this one, which looks like a D with a cross across it. And that's a voiced fricative sound. So that's as in the, so the theatre, the the bit is the that one that looks like a D, and the th, the theatre bit that's the, what looks like a P. So those are examples of old English letters, uh, which obviously have dropped away over time. Okay, so let's think more about lettering conventions, and there are certain uh, interchangeable letters that we've got in older texts. Uh, U and V. So if you look at lots of texts from time gone by, like from the Middle Age period, for example, then U's and V's are interchangeable. Indeed, the U uh, symbol only really appeared relatively late in the 10th century. And before that, the, the, the V, what looks to us like a V, was used both as the U uh and the V sound. So it was used as both a vowel and the consonant. So, for example, let's say you were spelling the word do, D-O-U-G-H, then you would have spelt it like that, D-O, and then it looks like a V, doesn't it? That's not to say that it was pronounced as a V, confusingly, but uh, there you go, D-O, looks like a V, G-H. Then what you get over time is that both letters are kind of used uh, as vowels interchangeably. And then finally, it really wasn't until the late 17th century that U was established as a vowel and V was established as a consonant. So it takes many centuries for the kind of rule to establish itself. Similarly with I and J, quite interchangeable, those two letters. Uh, the letter J appeared in the 15th century, so relatively late. And before that, I was used. So if you were spelling the Middle English word justice, which comes from Norman French, then it would have been spelt with what looks like an I at the beginning. So the I symbol there is actually representing a J sound. OK, and so you might see an I instead of a J in text right up to the mid 17th century. Then, of course, we've got the long S, right? So, you know, you get book titles like this. Now, if you're looking at this casually, you might think it says Paradise Loft. But you'd be wrong because it actually it's the name of the 17th century poem by John Milton, Paradise Lost. So those symbols there that look like F's, they are actually S's. So this is the long S. So before 1800, most printers used actually two uh, lowercase forms for S. Then you've got the so-called long S and, of course, the short S. Where did it come from? Well, ancient Latin. And because it came from ancient Latin, it had a certain kind of status. So it was thought that you must keep it. It was preserved by scribes in the ages that followed. 
If you go right back to old English texts like the Lindisfarne Gospels of the 17th century, there you will see the long S. And then over time, over the centuries, a kind of rule establishes itself about where you should put the long S and where you should put the short S. So by the 12th century, each letter had found a niche. So you put in your long S for the beginnings and middles of words, right? And then you're putting your short S at the ends of words. So if you're pluralizing a word, you just put your conventional short S on there. But if you're spelling a word like possession, for example, then you're going to put between four long S's because they're in the medial position of the word. So this trend was picked up by printers. It lasted right through until the end of the 18th century. Finally, we have this printer called John Bell, who'd been looking at some French printers and noticed that they dispensed with the long S. And he thought, well, that's sensible. And so when he opened his new newspaper, The World, in 1788, he decided, right, we're not going to have any long S's in there at all. So what that does is it gets rid of confusion confusion with F's and also the kind of jumbling up on the page of these long symbols. Okay, right. Now, so we've said some things there about uh, English lettering. Uh, spelling, of course, uh, causes a lot of angst amongst English speakers and writers. There are loads of perceived difficulties with the English spelling system. We have words that have silent letters so words like night, for example, it's got a K on the beginning. We have so-called homonyms. So we have words that are spelt the same, but are pronounced differently and have different meanings. So you've got S-O-W, meaning the female pig, sow. And then you've got so, as in the material verb to plant seeds. So those are called homonyms, OK, as opposed to homophones. So these are words that are spelt differently, that, but are pronounced the same. So, so and so, through and through, there are multifold examples of those. So there are lots of difficulties that people come across, uh, not least for non-native uh, learners of English with the spelling system. We're going to now just do like a, a brief history of English spelling. And basically, I'm drawing upon some of the information that's in the AQA textbook on page 204 and 205. So we start off with the idea that when you look at old English texts, provided that you know your old English alphabet, it's actually quite straightforward to read because it's phonetic. And so what's happened because of various complicated social and historical events, English has become more and more non-phonetic over time. The Norman conquest had a significant impact on the spelling system. It meant that French scribes were in charge of spelling English words, and therefore they dispensed with a lot of the old English conventions. So those, those letters that I told you about five minutes ago, the A, the ash symbol, the A and the E combined, those TH symbols, the one that looked like a P and the one that looked like a D, they were dispensed with by the French scribe. And in their place, they put uh, the kind of symbols that they were used to from, from spelling things in French. So you have, for example, Q being used for the first time. Uh, Q-U as a spelling rule comes in. So you get a word like queen, for example, which was a word that was spelled in Old English as C-W-E-N. And the Norman French come in and they start to use their own conventions. They spell it Q-U-E-E-N. OK, so Q is brought in. We have K as well that's brought in. We have X and we have Z. So these are all individual letters which start to be used in the Middle English period. We have William Caxton coming along. We mentioned him in a previous uh, video where we said, well, he because he has to choose a certain kind of English, he's an important name because his, his form of language is really a kind of forerunner of standard English. So attempts to regularize English spelling, you could argue, began with Caxton because he's trying to impose a certain order and rules onto the way that his uh, English is spelt in his texts. But the problem was that he had Flemish typesetters and they, in fact, were fairly irregular in the way that they spelt words. So take a simple word like book, for example. So in different editions and indeed within editions, book is spelt in different ways. 
So you have B O K E spelt in one place, and then you've got B double O K E spelt somewhere else. Okay, we've also got the problem of this thing that looks like a ye, as in ye olde English. You might be forgiven for assuming that ye must have been pronounced like that in times gone by, and that's why we say ye olde English. In fact, not so. There's a simple graphological reason for it. It's the idea that uh, the the symbol, which we've already talked about, i.e. that, that P, that uh, it looks like a P, but that's a, actually it's a th, and the D that looks like a looks like a D, but it's a the. Um, they were dispensed with, but that's how you spell the with that with that D. And people looked at it and thought, oh well, that must be a Y. So therefore, people in the past must have said ye rather than the. So that's a misconception. Okay, what else have we got? Oh yes, phonological change. So a further difficulty in sounding capturing the sound of English in the spelling was due to phonological change. Now we know, of course, that you know people people's speech patterns change over time. If you think over the last hundred years, how we've moved away from people in authority using a very strong marked RP accent, for example, and the rise in different accents, like for example, SUE English in the 1980s, and more recently, multicultural London English. So English sounds are changing all of the time, and therefore it makes it difficult when we're spelling things, because if we're saying originally English was a phonetic language, actually the pronunciation of words has changed over time. Okay. So what we have is this phenomenon called the great bowel shift, I sometimes call it. A great shifting of bowels. No, it's the great vowel shift. And so this was a period that started in the 14th century and went right through to the 18th century in which there was a drift. There was a shift in the way that people pronounced certain vowel sounds. Now, these are explained for you on the bottom of page 206, 204 in your AQA textbook, some examples. So we've got the word sit, right? So Middle English pronunciation, that's medieval times. Sit has become over time seat. And similarly, the word loss in Middle English over time has become our word lose. So in both those examples, a short vowel has become a long vowel. Other examples, Middle English pronunciation team has become current day English time. Middle English pronunciation hoose has become current day English house. So in those two examples, a long vowel has become a diphthong, which means two elided sounds together. Uh, I'll give you a couple more. Middle English pronunciation new has become the current day new and uh, Middle English word boat over time has become the present day pronunciation boot. So there you've got a diphthong that's moved to a long vowel. So what you're getting over the centuries is um, changes in the way that people are pronouncing things and it, it's a gradual slow process and uh, in different districts of the UK um, it's happening at different rates. Okay, so you're getting a word like blood, for example, that in one part of the country is spelt by people writing things down as B L O D, and then uh, by writers in other parts of the country it's spelt B L U D. And what that's doing is it's just reflecting differences in phonology, different accent features. And the other thing that I want to say is that when we get into the Renaissance period, which is the early modern English period, you get this further complication of the spelling system because writers start to look at the etymological roots of words and they feel that it's important to demonstrate where a word comes from in the first place and to signal that in the spelling conventions that are used. So take that word aventure, Aventure, which we, we came across when we were looking at that little bit of Middle English from the Canterbury Tales, meaning by chance, Aventure. And scholars start spelling that with a D in the early modern English period because they're, they're thinking, well, it comes from French. The, French. the original French and Latin word was Aventuras. It's got a D in it. 
So we ought to be putting a D in it as well. So you get further complications to the spelling system because of the way that writers are starting to spell things in the 16th century, drawing attention to the etymological roots of words. Okay, we've covered about the great vowel shift, so I won't uh, go on about that anymore. If you were in my group, I'd be getting you to watch this five minutes, uh, really good video entitled Why is English Spelling So Weird? where it takes you through these individual words. So for example, thought here, so we've got the complication of that GH sound. And this is the idea that, you know, we've got a Roman alphabet that's being used to express Old English sounds. Now an Old English sound was H like that, a bit like the Scottish English Loch like that, a bit as if you're sort of clearing your throat and about to spit on the pavement. <laughs> So they had a problem because they didn't have a symbol that would reflect in, in the Roman alphabet. They didn't have a symbol that would reflect that sound. So that's why we've ended up with this, this digraph that's being used. So the GH in there is reflective of that. We have words like knee, where over time, the, uh, the, the sound in the initial position has dropped away. So originally people would have pronounced the, this word as knee or knicht, night, and then over time that, uh, that sound has disappeared. Okay, so what's happened is that the phonology has shifted, but the spelling uh, rule has kind of fossilized. Then you've got words like beauty, where we can directly blame the French for that because it's the French scribes who are writing things down. They've got the word beau, as in il fait beau, beautiful. So that combination of vowels in there becomes the way that you spell words. So for quite a long time in English spelling, the answer, the question is, you know, why is it spelled that way? And it's one of two answers. Well, one, you either pronounce it that way, or secondly, the French used to spell it that way. Okay, but then you get into the Renaissance period, as we talked about, and they take words like receipts, for example, and they're trying to signal that this comes from Latin, uh, recipto, which has got a P, so that's why we have a P in there if you'll pardon the expression. And then you've got phlegm, okay, so that you've got a whole bunch of words which actually come from ancient Greek, uh, like asthma and phlegm and diarrhea. Um, so when people were writing that down, they wanted to signal the etymological root that it came from ancient Latin. And even a word like island, you know, you might think, oh, well, the S is in there because presumably at one time, English people pronounced island as Island. Not so, actually, you know, if you look at medieval text, Ireland is spelled I-L-A-N-D. And then in the Renaissance period, they wanted to signal that it actually came from the Latin insula, which has got an S in it. So we've got words that then come into the language which are borrowed, all of these words that that writer in the 16th century, Thomas Wilson, disapproved of, these incorn terms. And with them, they brought not only the new words, but also their spelling conventions as well. So champagne, for example, is mirroring the French spelling of that. Words like gorilla, uh, zucchini, for example, lots and lots of these words where the spelling is quite bizarre to us as English speakers. Uh, and that is also the same for kitsch as well, where we borrowed not only the, the word from the language, but also some of the spelling systems, like the non-phonetic spelling issues that are with that word. And it also, the video talks about the word kernel as well, where the pronunciation now mirrors the French kernel, but actually takes after the it Italian way of spelling it. Okay, so uh, if you have your AQA textbook, it's useful to have it open on page 205. And we have a letter here from William Shakespeare we're not interested so much in deconstructing the meaning of it. What we're really interested in is the graphological features that are going on and some of the non-current graphological features. Not easy necessarily to read, so I shall read it out aloud. So this is a letter written by Shakespeare. So this is written in the 1590s. Um, and it goes like this. Um, to the Right Honourable Henry Rothley, Earl of Southampton, and Baron of Titchfield. 
The love I dedicate to your Lordship is without end, whereof this pamphlet without beginning is but a superfluous moiety. The warrant I have of your honourable disposition, not the worse of my untutored lines, make it assured of acceptance. What I have done is yours. What I have to do is yours, being part in all I have devoted yours. Were my worth greater, my duty would show greater. Meantime, as it is, it's bound to your Lordship, to whom I wish long life still lengthened with all happiness. So what I would do there is I would pause the video and I would try and identify as many non-current graphological features as you can, remembering what we mean by graphological features here. So aspects of lettering, which are unusual to a current English text. So the lettering, aspects of spelling, and also there may be aspects of punctuation as well. Okay, let's talk through uh, some of these features then. So one of the things that you might have noticed is this thing about the U's and the V's, where we've got this adjective here, honourable, that's being used, and it looks like a V there, doesn't it? But actually, it's not pronounced as a V, it's actually a U. So we've got that interchangeability between U's and V's. Remember that we held on to that because it came from Latin, and I suppose the Romans used a V like that because it was easier for them to carve into stone straight lines rather than having cursive lines. So we've got that interchangeability between U's and V's. You may have noticed things to do with W's as well. So in places we've got a W which is quite conventional, like for example, William Shakespeare, the way that he's spelt his name there. But then when we look at this name over here, Rothsley, you know, we have de definitely there two, a double U. So two V's have been put next to each other. So there is an inconsistency in the way that the W is articulated. We have this pesky long S, don't we, which does make it difficult for us to be reading because we're coming across words and all the time we're thinking, is this an F or is this an S? And so we've got this rule that's being applied that if you've got an S that's either at the front or the middle of a word, i.e. in the uh, primal or medial position, then you're going to do a long S. And if you've got a word that's got an S at the end of a word, like, for example, it's a plural, let's say there, for example, yours, then it's a small S. So you look on the last word there, happiness, because the, the S is there and not actually right at the end of the word, then it's put forward as a long S. We have some additional letters in here. So some words that we, you know, we have extra letters that we wouldn't have in current day English. I'm thinking about words like do, for example, with its E on the end. So this is following a sort of French convention of sounding out and putting an E sound like a schwa sound on the end of a lots of words. Presumably at this time, William Shakespeare actually would have sounded that. So it wouldn't have just been do, it would have been do like that with a kind of extra vowel sound on the end. Uh, at the same time, you've got some removed letters too. And we've got odd things going on with capitalization. So our current day rule where you only put a capital letter at the beginning of a sentence or to show it it's a proper noun or uncertain pronouns like I, well, we have lots more capital letters. So when Shakespeare comes to what he thinks is an important word in the sentence, like moiety, which means a part, or honorable here, which is a pre-modifying adjective, then he's spelling it with a capital letter in order to show its importance. Remember, all of this is done before these rules of English have really been nailed down by the grammarian prescriptivists in the 18th century. And then you've got punctuation, where you've actually got quite a raft of, of punctuation being used to try and sort out the meaning of the sentence. So you've got, for example, in that last sentence there, you've got quite a load of commas to try to show the prosodic features. If you were to read that aloud, this is where you're going to be pausing. 
I think in current day English, you would go, were my worth greater, my duty would show greater. And then we would have a full stop in there to show that that's the end of a standard sentence. Instead, he's put a, a comma and he's going, meantime, and I don't think in current day English, we would put a comma there either. So it's not easy for us to be writing, reading this thing out aloud. OK, so that's given you a bit of a flavour of graphological change through the centuries. And in the next, next video, we're going to be thinking about people's attempts to reform English spelling. Thanks very much.